With this, let me start uh, by talking about cache networks, an information theoretic view. Uh, there will be three parts to this talk. In the first talk, in the first part, I will talk about, uh, give you an overview of cache systems. I'll tell you a little bit why caching is relevant today. I'll give you examples of several cache, cache systems, and I will mention uh, you know, performance metrics and some of the history of, uh, of, uh, of this topic. Then part two, Muhammad will talk about single cache systems. So this is this theory of um, systems that have a single cache uh, that was mostly developed in computer science and systems community um, in the 80s and 90s, I would say. Then in part three, we will be talking about networks of caches. And this is, uh, these are re results that we're presenting that were mostly derived in the information theory, th theory literature um, over the last, say, maybe three, four years. All right, let me start with part one then. Uh, I'll give an overview of cache systems. And really the reason why uh, caching is relevant today is because of the rise of content. And what I'm showing here is a, uh, a figure from Cisco, from a Cisco study, which shows how much of wireless traffic is content. And you can see, I mean, some of this is prediction, some of this is measurement. So Cisco predicts that by 2019, the vast majority of mobile uh, traffic will be video related. Okay. So video on demand, in fact, is driving wireless traffic growth. And uh, Cisco predicts that uh, by 2019, video accounts for almost three quarters of, of uh, wireless traffic. Okay, so the interesting thing about this content, so by, by video, I mean here, uh, you know, video that is pre-recorded, say for example, shows or, 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 or movies. And the interesting thing about this is that it is pre-recorded. And hence, you know upfront um, the data that will, be, that will be requested. So this is not like, for example, a voice communication where the data is generated on the fly, but rather here it is generated upfront. So this was content uh, in the wireless context. The same also holds true for the wireline content. So this is the, from the say, or a, a different Cisco study, which predicts that, again, by 2017, internet video and managed IP video will account for a vast chunk of wireline traffic. So video on demand also dominates wireline traffic. And in fact, there's a study by Sandveen from a year ago that showed that uh, Netflix and YouTube, both of which are popular um, video distribution systems in the US, alone, those two alone, account for close to half of peak downstream traffic in the US uh, over wireline internet. Okay, so it's actually a remarkable number that these two video servers by themselves uh, essentially account for half of the traffic during peak times. Okay, so uh, content, again, uh, very important in, in wireline systems. Now, the reason why caching is relevant here is because given that you know the shows that are, uh, might be requested later on, you can, in fact, cache them up front. And why might you want to do that? It's because video has a particular temporal behavior. So what I'm drawing here is a uh, normalized demand in a video, video on demand system. And you can see that there's high temporal traffic variability. So for example, during uh, early morning hours, 6 a.m. in the morning, there is very little video use or network use. And then late in the afternoon, 6, 8, 10 p.m., there's very heavy use of the system. Now what that means is that you have to provision your system or your network to handle this peak demand. But of course, you only make money on the average demand. And that means that you have networks that are over-provisioned during off-peak times. So at 6 a.m. in the morning, you have a network that is half empty, which of course is not good for uh, ISPs. Now caching can help to smooth traffic. So one use of caching is that you could use the empty network or the uh, underutilized network resources in the early morning hours to prefetch some of the content, and thereby you can hope to reduce the traffic during peak hours in the evening. Okay, so this is one use of, of caching, and I think what is really driving the interest at this very moment. Okay, so now in the next few slides, I'll give you a few examples of cache systems that are in operation today, and you will see one of them, or one or two of them, is in the context of uh, video traffic, and then other ones are in different contexts. So this gives you some idea of the breadth of, of cache networks. Okay, so the first one is Netflix, which is exactly in the video content. 
So Netflix, for those who don't know, uh, is a, a, a popular US video on demand system. So since 2012, Netflix has been operating their own content distribution network, CDN. And uh, the way this works is that ISPs can deploy a Netflix operated cache into their network. So uh, when an ISP will contact Netflix, Netflix will ship them uh, a box with, uh, or a server preloaded with over 100 terabytes of content, so video content, which corresponds, if you compute it, it corresponds to approximately four years of HD video, which I think is a, an amazing number. And uh, every night, Netflix pushes up to 7.5 terabytes of daily updates onto the server. So the server sits in the ISP's network, but it's operated by and controlled by Netflix. And uh, this, this um, pushing of traffic or of, of updates is done from 2 a.m. to noon local time. And as you recall, this corresponds exactly to this dip in the demand curve. So this is during the time where the network is very likely underutilized. So this makes use of the periods of low network load. Okay, and uh, Netflix says that this caches serve, serves approximately 60 to 80% of the content requests. So this results in a large, content, large traffic reduction for the ISP who now can serve this part of the content from the cache as opposed to having to fetch it from, uh, from Netflix itself. Another example is Akamai. So Akamai started, I think, in the late 90s with, uh, with caching for websites, but now it's also doing video. So the internet consists of approximately 10,000 or maybe slightly more autonomous networks or systems. So each of these autonomous systems, which are abbreviate with AS, is, uh, is operated by, say, a different ISP or a different entity. Okay, so here, a small network of, uh, of nine AS, ASs. And uh, these autonomous systems are organized into three tiers. So you have tier one, ISPs or, or autonomous systems, tier two, autonomous systems, and tier three, autonomous systems. And they have different peering agreements. And typically the way it works is that if you have two autonomous systems or ISPs that are at the, are at the same tier level, then they will carry each other's traffic for free. Uh, on the other hand, if you have a uh, tier two ISP or AS, that is connected to a tier one ISP, then the tier two ISP will have to pay some money to the tier one ISP to, uh, for that ISP to carry its traffic. Okay, so, so money goes from, top to, uh, from bottom to top here. But crucially, tier ISPs at the same level don't ask payment for each other. Okay, so for example, if this ISP or AIS sends a packet to AS1 via AS4, then no money would be exchanged for that packet to traverse to AS4. Now, for economic reasons, which is exactly these peering agreements, the links between them are bottlenecks. And you can easily see why that is the case. Because AS4 gets no money from AS5 to carry its traffic. And hence, it has no incentive to upgrade this link here. Right? In fact, if this link becomes very strong, then instead of, say, AS5 wants to send a packet to AS1, instead of routing it through this link, where AS5 would have to pay something, it will very likely just send it over to AS4. Okay. So for these reasons, uh, these ISPs or ASs have an economic incentive to have these links to be weak. And in fact, sometimes they, they, uh, they break and you know, there's lots of disagreements between these ISPs over, over exactly this issue. Now Akamai has approximately 100,000 or maybe a bit more edge caches that they have distributed in these autonomous systems. And uh, so into each of these autonomous systems, they have maybe one or perhaps several um, caches. And this reduces the traffic over these inter-AS bottlenecks. Okay, so if you have a cache in here, and say there is an origin server with, who has the website that a user wants to load here, then instead of having to traverse this entire network here, you can directly serve it from the cache in AS9. Okay, so this uh, reduces the traffic over inter-AS bottleneck links. It also reduces the load on the orig origin server. And typically, there's a second layer of parent caches. So there's a cache hierarchy. There's edge caches here, and then there's a second layer of caches uh, higher up. And in 2013, Akamai says uh, that they carry 20% of internet traffic. Okay, so this is a vast amount of infrastructure that they, that they put in place and uh, that carries a significant amount of internet traffic today. A third cache system uh, example is Facebook. So Facebook uses a hierarchy of caches for photo distribution. 
And the way this works is that you have a user, and then you have a layer of number of, of caches until you reach the back end, which is a big, uh, a, a big uh, server farm where they host all their, their photos. Okay, so there is a cache close to the user. That uh, the cache is close to the user serve, in fact, the majority of traffic. So the cache in the browser, which is in, in your computer, would uh, typically serve about 65% of, of the traffic. The edge caches, which are in your access ISP or, or close to it, will serve maybe 20. And then there's an origin cache, which serves 5%, and the back end itself serves maybe 10% of traffic. Okay, so you can see that the significant amount of, of traffic is actually served by caches and not by the, by the back end itself. Now, the primary objectives differ by, by the layer. The origin cache uh, reduces, so this cache here, reduces the backend server load. Okay, so you want to make sure that this backend server doesn't get uh, overloaded. And uh, this origin so cache like, shields that backend server. So this is a, a form of load balancing, if you want. The edge caches reduce the traffic to the origin cache. So their goal is to minimize the number of bits that have to be sent through this link. And the browser cache mainly serves to reduce delay because you have very quick, uh, very quick uh, loading of the, of the photo. So as a fourth uh, cache system example, let me talk a little bit about domain name systems. So just to give you a very brief introduction, uh, this is how the domain, system, domain name system is used to resolve uh, an, um, a name for, uh, say, a website, say, wikipedia.org. So you want to have that server name, and you want to resolve it into an IP address. So the IP address here would be... Uh, I don't know, uh, whatever, some, uh, some, some string, something like this. Okay, so the question is, how does this resolution happen? And uh, th this resolution happens in a recursive way. So you uh, say your browser tries to connect to uh, wikipedia.org. It will first check locally uh, if, um, to, to do this translation. Then the, the local browser engine will, com uh, will, will connect to the operating system, who will then connect to your ISPs domain name server. And your domain name server here of your ISP will then recursively resolve the, the domain name. First, it will contact the root name server, which is the, the server that handles the .org, uh, for the server handling the .org, .org uh, domains. Then it will contact the server for the .org domain to ask, ask that server who is responsible for Wikipedia. Then it will contact that server, the server handling wikipedia.org, who will then finally hand back the entire address. Okay, so this is how this works. Okay, so that's what I just said. And there's a root DNS server that is this one here. There's a top level domain DNS server that's this named server. And then there's an authoritative DNS server that is this server, okay? Now, what happens is that caching, at every level of the system, you have caching. So you have caching in your browser you have caching in your operating system, you have caching at the ISP, and then you have caching in all these, in all these servers. And um, this reduces delay, the delay, and, and the DNS server load. So delay is obvious. You, each time you enter a new, a new address into your browser, this process has to be uh, repeated. So if each of these round trips times is maybe 50 milliseconds or 100 milliseconds, you can see that it very quickly adds up. Um, furthermore, it reduces DNS server load. You can imagine that for each time, you had to contact the root name server, then this name server very quickly would be overloaded, okay? because you have maybe a billion requests every second or something like that. And uh, there is a time to live field in the, in the, that is associated with each entry that tells you how long the cached entry is valid. Okay, so here, a very different caching, uh, caching system has nothing to do with content. Nevertheless, ca caching is very important for system performance. As another example, uh, is uh, wireless edge caches. This is something that is currently being thought about, uh, mainly in the context of 5G. Uh, so uh, wireless providers are deploying femtocells to handle wireless data demand. And each base station area will contain many such femtocells. Okay, so you have a base station area covering maybe a kilometer square or something like that. And then you have many, many femtocells that will be installed in various places within, within that base station area. Each femtocell has a small coverage which means that you can have high spatial reuse. And typically, the femtocell backhaul is, is weak, so can be a bottleneck. So sometimes the idea is that you would even use a broadband access to, to link this up to the internet. 
Now, caching at these femtocells was recently introduced as a, as a proposal, and it's beneficial for several reasons. First of all, you reduce the traffic over these weak uh, backhaul, backhauls from the femtocell to the internet. You increase offloading from the base station to these femtocells, which is beneficial because they're closer to you than the base station is itself. And you can do copper, copper delivery from several femtocells for load balancing and increased rates over the wireless channel. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the third part of the talk or the tutorial. OK, then I'll have one last example, which is a computer memory hierarchy. And in fact, uh, this is here. I'm presenting this here because this was the original motivation for many of the developments in, in this literature. Uh, so if you have a computer memory, it is organized hierarchically. So you have a CPU. Then on the CPU or very close to the CPU is a level 2 cache. Then you have a level 3 cache. Then you have a bigger uh, RAM, random access memory. And finally, you have a hard drive. Now, the memory sizes uh, in this hierarchy increase from left to right. And at the same time, the access delay also increases from left to right. So here are a few representative values for the size and delay. And this is from, it's a few years old, but I mean, the, the general, general trend is the same. So for example, the level 2 cache will, might have 512 kilobytes. Level 3, 6 megabytes. Uh, level um, RAM might have 8 gigabytes. And hard drive might have 1 terabyte. So you can see each time you go up by maybe uh, um, a factor 10 to the 3 or something like that. In terms of access times, uh, a level 2 cache maybe has 12 cycles, 12 CPU cycles to access it. Um, level 3, maybe 36. RAM has maybe 170 CPU cycles. And this one is really shocking. If you go from RAM to hard drive, um, uh, maybe you might have uh, 10 to the 7 uh, CPU cycles. So you can see, if you read this, you can see that proper cache management is very important. Because if each time you want to add two numbers, you have to go and read them from your hard drive, you lose 10 to the 7 CPU cycles right there and then. Okay? So, so clearly, this will not work. And in fact, you, can, you, you probably have even uh, seen this kind of effect if you, in MATLAB, say you try to uh, uh, multiply two matrices or something like that, or, or factor, factor a matrix, um, it, it'll go quite well. And at some point, uh, it'll, go, it'll become very, very slow. And that's typically the moment when uh, your matrix does not fit into RAM anymore. So I, I suspect most of you will have, uh, will have uh, witnessed this kind of effect firsthand. So proper cache management is very important here, specifically between, uh, over this, or, you know, between RAM and hard drive. And in this context, it's typically called paging, uh, because this, uh, this I mean, the, the unit of memory that is swapped from hard drive to RAM is called a page. And as I said, this was the original motivation for the development of many caching algorithms. All right. So I've given you a, a broad overview of, of uh, many cache systems from very different areas, some uh, older, some newer. And as you can imagine, depending on the application, there will be different performance metrics that you would, might want to optimize. Uh, for example, you might want to reduce the amount of traffic that goes over a particular link. And this we had seen in the Netflix example, where you wanted to minimize the amount of traffic that uh, had to go uh, out, of the, out of your ISP. Uh, we had seen it in the Akamai example between over the bottleneck links. We had seen it in the Facebook and in the wireless example. A second performance metric is delay reduction. So you might want to minimize the amount of time it takes between when the user clicks a button and, it, uh, between, and, and he gets a corresponding response. This we had seen in the Akamai example. Uh, in the Facebook example, where it was the browser cache that helped with this. Very important in the DNS example, where you wanted to make sure that each time you resolve an, uh, a name, you don't have to wait you know, five or 10 round trips times uh, to actually get it. And also in computer memories, uh, it was very important here. Then you might be interested in load balancing, <clears throat> or it might be also called scalability or availability. These names are somewhat used interchangeably. Um, by this, I mean that <clears throat> you want to make sure that if a single server fails, that the whole system does not go down. Or if many, many users are using the system at the same time, that there's not a single server that will be completely swamped and, and hence will, will become a bottleneck. And um, this we had seen in the Akamai example, Facebook, DNS. Here it was the root server that would, have, uh, that would be getting swamped if, if, uh, if you didn't have caching, and also in the wireless example. OK, so importantly, for systems with a single cache, 
it turns out that all these three performance metrics can be captured by a single quantity, which is the hit rate. So the hit rate is the number or the percentage of requests that are uh, served by the cache as opposed to having to be served by the origin server. Okay, and you can see that this is the case. Uh, I mean, if, if, if uh, most of the cache, uh, most of the uh, hits come from the cache, then this reduces the traffic, it reduces delay, and it decreases load balancing. Okay, so for this reason, if you look at the literature on single cache systems and essentially every, anything uh, before maybe up to five years ago or so, it will focus on this number, hit rate. Now, one of the important insights that is coming from, uh, from this information theoretic work on cache networks is that if you look at two or more caches, then this hit rate is no longer representative of all these three quantities. And in particular, you may have to look at traffic reduction or relay reduction individually. Okay, and it's no longer captured by just hit rate. And we'll talk about that much more in the following. Then we had seen that there's really two types of systems. Uh, one is online and one is offline caching. So these cat, and this refers to the way the caches are updated. In the offline or proactive updating, you fill the caches during off-peak times before the demands occur. Okay, so content is prefetched to the caches, perhaps during a time of low network use. And the example here, the prime example, is the Netflix example, which, as you remember, during the early morning hours, I think it was 2 a.m. to noon, they push content onto the caches at the ISPs. Then there's a second way of operating these caches or updating the caches, which is called online or reactive. Here, content is only sent to the caches when a cache miss occurs. So a user requests an item, it is not in the cache. At that moment, the cache fetches it from the origin server. And that's the only way you get new content into the, into the server. So content leading to the cache miss is typically put in the cache by default. And what you do then have to do is you have to somehow find space for that, for that new item. And of course, your cache will be full, so you have to decide which item you want to kick out or evict from the cache. Okay, so the question then is, what's an optimal eviction rule to, uh, to kick out uh, or evict an item from your cache? And examples of this type of, of system was Akamai, Facebook, the domain name system, and the computer memories. They all operate in this online fashion. Okay. Then finally, let me talk a little bit about content request models. So uh, several models uh, have been, have been um, considered in the literature and uh, typically in different, quantity, in different communities. So there's uh, worst case requests, which is used mostly in information theory. And in this setting, you compute the, worst, the rate under the worst possible requests of, of the users. Then there's something called uh, individual sequence or competitive analysis which is used mostly in CS theory. Here you compute the rate uh, of your algorithm compared to that of a clairvoyant algorithm, which knows the entire future of, uh, of the requests in advance. Finally, there is something called the independent reference model, which is used mostly in the systems community. Uh, here you assume that you have IID requests over time with either a known or an unknown content popularity uh, distribution. And you can generalize this to Markov models across time. And uh, you know, depending on, on your, your problem setting or on the system, uh, different of these, uh, these will make, make most sense. And we'll talk about them in, in more detail in the next two parts. All right, so this concludes uh, part one of, uh, of the tutorial. Uh, here are a few references we'll, uh, that, that were mentioned in the slides. We'll put them up on the web, I think, as well. Any questions about part one? Sure. So, I mean, this, I think here this is mostly over this, the same geographical area, right? I think that's the, the, the most reasonable way to think of this. So, if, if you think of the, if you think of the, uh, 
the Akamai example, so they have, or face even the Netflix example, uh, they, they will have a cache, say, um, say at each ISP or maybe even in each major city, so or maybe each geographical area. So I, I don't think it really becomes an issue. All right. 